All right, so welcome. On uh, this uh, uh, lecture, we're going to cover Ouroboros proof of stake. We're going to start from the origins of the protocol and then take it to Ouroboros Prowse, which we present this year, and then to the uh, next evolution of the protocol, which is Ouroboros Genesis. Um, let me start with uh, the concept of a robust transaction ledger, uh, which is the problem that Bitcoin protocol solves. So uh, the formalization of the, of the problem was itself like an interesting question, which was something that we tackled uh, a few years ago already now. This was uh, work that was with uh, Juan Caray and Nicos Leonardos. That was the first formal definition of the objective of a robust transaction ledger. Now, this uh, work, which uh, you can find it here, uh, basically set out a crisp model and an objective uh, that uh, a ledger protocol has to meet. Um, and after that work, there was a number of other papers that took that model and improved it in a number of ways. And I'll just uh, mention a, a few of them that came out of the years afterwards. Mainly the definitions were further refined. Uh, partial synchrony was considered, and finally there was a composable definition that was uh, presented just uh, in the summer last year at Crypto. So, what does it take to realize uh, the ledger? So, realizing the ledger is something that, as you can expect, it can be achieved by Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself, the Bitcoin protocol, was the inspiration for defining this problem. Um, nevertheless, uh, this uh, solution also, I, I should say, came out, uh, in retrospect at least, somewhat unexpected. I mean, the problem itself was never considered in this setting, the problem of consensus or the problem of uh, having a ledger of that type that Bitcoin solves. So, uh, you might actually, if you look at the theoretical results in the distributed systems literature, you might even consider that result as impossible. Uh, given though that we knew uh, that the barrier uh, without using some type of public infrastructure was one third uh, of the uh, number of parties that might be malicious and Bitcoin was achieving that well, with a threshold that was going close to 50%. So despite this remarkable uh, feature of the protocol to provide us consensus in this setting, um, there are significant scalability and energy efficiency disadvantages that the protocol has. So the clear question came to be, once we have this and we understand the problem that the protocol solves, is it possible to realize it in a more efficient way without fundamentally compromising any of the basic assumptions and the features of the objective that the protocol tries to solve. So proof of stake was uh, an idea that early on by the Bitcoin community was considered as an alternative and in the Bitcoin forum were many discussions uh, about how it might be feasible to use that in place of proof of work, which is in the case of Bitcoin. So a little bit of background about what is proof of stake. Now if you look at the way that the blockchain protocol works in Bitcoin, it's a little bit like an election. Uh, so what happens is that the next entity that is going to produce the block that is going to be added to the blockchain is elected and in some sense is elected with probability proportional to its hashing power. So basically the more hashing power you have, the more chances you have of being elected and produce the next block. Now collisions, so to speak, may occur. The system is decentralized, there is no coordination between the parties that are running the protocol uh, and the protocol itself is designed to be able to absorb such collisions, to absorb um, such uh, momentary, temporary disagreements between the parties. So all that is fundamentally based on this concept of proof of work. So modifying this is uh, what proof of stake is about. So using stake, which is a virtual resource instead of hashing power, which is a physical resource, uh, is at the core of the POS idea. So, well, in POW, in proof of work, we're going to have the set of stakeholders uh, being the miners in some sense. This will be substituted by those that have stake, which is reported in the ledger. And once we have this, then we have to come up with a randomized process uh, 
that is uh, capable of emulating basically the same election idea that uh, naturally comes in uh, the proof-of-work domain. So this idea proved to be very powerful and motivated a number of people to propose a lot of protocols uh, for our, um, implementing the proof-of-stake uh, concept. So there are two fundamental approaches uh, here that you can consider proof-of-stake. The one is a proof-of-stake blockchain, where basically what you try to do is um, think uh, in the same way that the Bitcoin blockchain works and use proof-of-stake in a way that does not jeopardize any of the features that the proof-of-work protocol um, provides. And examples of these protocols is Ouroboros, the protocol I'll be talking about today, Snow White, Next, and a number of others. The other approach is based on classical building fault tolerant protocols, um, which uh, can somehow be upgraded to operate in the POS setting. And uh, an example of that is Algorand. So both approaches are POS, since what, what is important here is that participation in the protocol is based on your stake, as that stake is reported in the ledger. So POS didn't come without its controversy. There was an early folklore idea um, that was discussed among many people that were uh, working in the Bitcoin space that POS blockchains are fundamentally impossible to work. Uh, and the main deficiencies or vulnerabilities that people were pointing at were, uh, can be pointed, can be summarized in these costly simulation uh, uh, vulnerability that the POS has intrinsically, um, and the ability of attackers to mount what's called long-range attacks. Let me just explain in a bit more detail what are those. So a costly simulation basically suggests that in the absence of proof of work, proof of stake after all is a proof of a virtual resource, there is nothing that prevents you from doing this over and over, perhaps in parallel multiple times. So a fundamental difference between a proof-of-work based blockchain and a POS based blockchain is the fact that in the proof-of-work case, the all parties they have to commit to a certain uh, protocol execution and advance that execution uh, using their proof-of-work uh, algorithm. That's not the case in POS um, and it's not the case because it's really costless or nearly costless to execute the POS protocol. Um, thus, in principle, the adversary has really literally nothing at stake and is capable of advancing multiple different executions of the protocol so that it finds one that is the most favorable. Um, and that could lead to what has been called like a long-range attack. So basically in a long-range attack you have a victim node that tries to distinguish between two alternative histories which are furnished by the network without having access to recent information. And recent information here is key. I mean, if you are constantly online, you have a good understanding about what is communicated in the network. Nevertheless, imagine that you join the network after a big hiatus or basically you're just a new node that doesn't have any other information about what was going on. And in that case, you face the bootstrapping problem. How do you, are you able to synchronize with the right blockchain without having any recent information? So just to understand how this uh, comes like in practice, so here is uh, just a visual depiction of this bootstrapping from Genesis problem, where you have the Genesis block, let's say, you have a new party, and the new party now tries to, to find what is the right history. Um, he doesn't have any information about the protocol, um, until at least the, for, for instance, you can even say the Genesis block, and now you have the honest parties which are um, providing this uh, uh, blockchain that you see at the top, and then you have the adversary that is providing the blockchain at the bottom. So what we want is that the new party, presumably honest, would like to join the top version of the history. Um, the only information the new party has is the Genesis block, and he's faced with that decision. So, how does this work in the proof-of-work world? So what happens in the proof-of-work world is that what you can prove 
is that the main chain, the, part, the chain that is maintained by the honest parties, is going to have the most blocks. Or, to be more precise, is going to have an aggregate difficulty which is higher than the alternative chain. So basically, the adversarial version will be substantially shorter, counting difficulty as length, and that will enable the party to just connect to the correct blockchain. Um, so this is a very powerful idea, and you see, in some sense, relies intrinsically on the fact that this is uh, a long blockchain represents aggregate proof of work, and um, the resources of the honest parties are assumed to be in a strict majority. So basically, the majority of the hashing power is with the parties that follow the protocol, while the adversary is in the minority of the hashing power. Clearly, this argument would not work. Uh, if uh, things were otherwise, and there was an adversary that has the majority of housing power. So this setting suggests the following model for understanding how blockchain protocols operate, which we call dynamic availability. So dynamic availability is a setting where we analyze a blockchain protocol um, that suggests an environment that parties will join and live at will, there is a number of offline and online parties that dynamically change over time. They may lose clock synchronization, they may lose their network connection, and there will be no a priori knowledge of the participation at any given time. So, the blockchain setting is, um, dynamic availability is what people would like these protocols to work on. Um, so we have to see how proof-of-work compares to proof-of-stake with respect to dynamic availability. So let's see, um, compare for example the Bitcoin protocol with a POS blockchain or a POS BFT protocol. Now in terms of setup assumptions, there is a first difference. Uh, a Bitcoin protocol uh, uses a common random string, as it is frequently called in the cryptographic literature, or basically the Genesis block contains a random string and that is common and shared by all the parties that run the protocol. On the other hand, in the case of a POS blockchain and or a POS BFT protocol, what we assume as a starting point is a public key directory. So in both cases, this is a shared assumption and the difference uh, lies on the fact that the common random string is basically can just be a string in the sky, something that is random, unpredictable, till the moment it appears and everybody agrees on that. Whereas a public key directory, basically, it is what it is. It's basically a set of keys that have been accumulated and they provide the root of trust of the system. So this is a fundamental difference between POW and POS, and this is something that is going to remain. So this is like something that typifies, let's say, the proof-of-work concept and the POS concept. Nevertheless, in both cases, this is a setup assumption, and as long as we are capable of somehow ensuring that this setup assumption is there, then uh, uh, the whole protocol is, is going to be hopefully safe after that. Long-range attacks, though. How do they deal with long-range attacks? So in the case of Bitcoin and a proof-of-work-based blockchain, the longest chain rule is sufficient, for the same reason I told you. So basically, a party that uh, is bootstrapping from Genesis and potentially faces a long-range attack uh, will just follow the blockchain that has the biggest number of blocks or the highest difficulty, uh, and it will be, can be shown that it connects to the right blockchain. Um, unfortunately, what happens in the POS domain, things are not as simple. So there are a number of assumptions that people have used to deal with long-range attacks, and you will see that many of them are not quite satisfactory. Mostly is that the longest chain rule, for example, that is used in POS blockchain, is not sufficient. And what is frequently assumed by uh, these papers, essentially all POS papers in one way or another, is what we can call a local moving checkpoint. So essentially the parties are assumed to not diverge to any alternative blockchain uh, compared to the history they have. So they have basically a recent block that they trust, and they just remain that. Perhaps that's a block that has naturally evolved because they are online all the time, or it's a block that they heard from another node. In a sense, that requirement means that if you are not online all the time, 
you will have no way of having such recent information, such local checkpoint, and thus someone will have to provide you that. And that would be basically an assumption that when you're initialized in such a POS blockchain, you'll have to get some trusted information. Now, this is fundamentally different from the POW setting, uh, at least in all these previous protocols. Um, another requirement is to have key evolving signatures, which uh, is something that doesn't exist in POW, but it is something that uh, we know cryptographically how to uh, design. Um, if we look at the same question at the POS B of T case, we also want key evolving signatures, but now a different requirement uh, comes up. What happens in the BFT case is essentially that the nodes that are running the protocol agree on all blocks. That means that you do not have forks because every time that you produce a block, there is sufficient agreement about that. So you do not have to resolve uh, such type of collisions or disagreements that we were um, having to deal with in the blockchain setting. Uh, nevertheless, in order to run such protocols, you will have to have a good understanding of what is the level of participation. So this points to this deficiencies that you see are described in this slide. So while dynamic availability is feasible in the POW setting using only the Genesis block, in the POS blockchain setting, rejoining parties would need a somewhat recent block. Whereas in the POS BFT setting, parties will need to know participation level at all times in history. And these are both strong requirements that hurt this general setting of dynamic availability that uh, a POW proof of work based uh, blockchain like Bitcoin works. So, uh, in summary, POS blockchain so far they need to have additional advice to do this bootstrapping from Genesis information. The longest chain rule in itself is insufficient, while POS BFT, the level of actual participation needs to be known throughout. Um, so, and the reason, as I mentioned, is that these BFT protocols, they have to rely on these counting decisions uh, that need accurate estimates of participation. So all this is the motivation for the new version of uh, the Ouroboros protocols that we call Ouroboros Genesis. So the new version of the protocol is exactly dealing with this problem of dynamic availability. And the intention is to see whether it is feasible to produce a POS blockchain that is capable of natively working in the same setting as Bitcoin. So, the Ouroboros Genesis protocol is a new milestone in the line of Ouroboros POS-based blockchains. The protocol is based on Ouroboros Prowse, which uh, will be presented in uh, Eurocrypt 2018 and the Ouroboros protocol, which was presented in 2017 at Crypto. The main novel feature is that we design a new chain selection rule that enables parties to bootstrap from Genesis. So let's take a step back and see how the Ouroboros protocol works. So the protocol was designed together with a formal proof that realized the functionality of a robust transaction ledger. And that's one of the fundamental distinctions that was uh, put in place in the design of the protocol. So we designed the, the protocol together with a proof that the protocol uh, is capable of realizing a uh, distributed ledger. The proof strategy involves properties of the underlying blockchain data structure, and these are properties that are shared uh, with the Bitcoin proof of work analysis. Common prefix, chain quality and chain growth, these are the uh, fundamental properties that previous work has identified as the important building blocks for arguing security uh, for blockchain protocols. The analysis pairs the honest parties against an adversary that controls a malicious um, coalition of parties that is in the minority in terms of stake. And furthermore, the adversary has complete network dominance in the sense that is capable of delaying messages, and acting after all the honest parties. The assumption that is done though for the network is that uh, messages are eventually delivered. So there is an upper bound in the delay of the network, which is not known uh, to the participants, um, that uh, within which parties will actually receive messages. So it's not possible to stifle information uh, from being propagated in the network. 
So the design of all robust protocols uh, follows this uh, structured stage uh, approach uh, that comes as follows. First, the protocol is an initial analysis is performed in a setting where state is static. So it's basically like we freeze the stake of everyone and we see how the protocol works. Um, then uh, we use randomness, a randomness source, which you can think otherwise unspecified, like a randomness beacon that at regular intervals emits a unpredictable value. And we show how we can basically bootstrap the protocol, the, base, the stage one protocol, that is static stake, to a setting where stake is allowed to move and evolve over time. And then finally, at stage three, we show how it's possible to remove the assumption of the beacon and using cryptography or some type of cryptographic implementation um, show how the protocol itself can emulate the beacon. Um, so here's an example of the static stake segment or how it might uh, advance. So what you see here is a, a sequence of uh, blocks that are produced in time, starting from the leftmost side where we have a genesis block. Let's say that's B0 that you see on the left side of, this, uh, of the screen. Um, and then moving on, the time moves forward to the right. What happens is that every moment in time, every heartbeat of the protocol, there is a certain party that is identified uh, and is capable of producing uh, one of the blocks. Um, so that assumption is happening for most of uh, the moments in the protocol, but there will be also moments by design that will also be silent. For example, this is what you see in the fourth, uh, in the fourth time moment uh, in that sequence, uh, in that time window here. What happens when, when you are elected to produce a block, then you issue a block using essentially just a digital signature, and that is distributed to the other parties that are running the protocol. Now, that block is connected to the previous block that uh, an entity knows. Um, if there are points in time, which in the protocol uh, model we call them slots, so if there are slots where nobody is elected, then this by definition is going to be a silent slot. But there might be also a slot where multiple parties are elected at the same time. The election process itself is based on a randomized process, which initially it is seeded uh, by the Genesis block. So this is how the first segment of the protocol, let's say, advance. And if you also want to think about it, this is the first few moments of protocol execution. Um, conflicts are bound to occur. And the protocol uses a simple longest chain rule uh, to uh, choose what is the correct history. So once we have this in place, here is how the evolving uh, stage of the protocol will take place, which uses a randomness beacon that regularly emits unpredictable values. So what you have is a sequence of blocks that are produced in the static setting, where basically stake is assumed to be frozen. Um, and then what happens is that the beacon value is emerged and in some sense refreshes the randomness that will produce the next segment. Now what happens is that during that time, the stake that is assumed to provide the safety of the protocol is assumed to be frozen, but the real stake is not assumed to be frozen. And it's possible to flow arbitrarily between the participants. What we do is that when we are about to uh, go to the onset of the next stage of the protocol, which in our technology is called an epoch, um, the protocol looks at the stake as it has evolved in the first epoch and then creates the stake that will provide the safety of the second epoch. And this is what happens. And now you go into that recursively in an indefinite cycle. There is another basically stakeholder distribution that has evolved from the first epoch, guaranteeing the safety of the second epoch, um, and the protocol advances in this fashion. When we are ready for the next epoch, again we 
look at the ledger, collect the stakeholders, produce the next randomness value, and so forth. Finally, in some cryptographic fashion, we need to show how the beacon itself can be implemented. So let's look, uh, take a dive a bit deeper uh, and see how the security analysis works. Um, if you look at the protocol execution as I described it, you can think of a string that we call a characteristic string. Every heartbeat, every moment in time, can be assigned one of three values. Zero means if the parties that follow the protocol own that slot. One is when the adversarial coalition controls that slot. And the next sign, bottom, means that nobody controls that slot. So, this is a type of a random sequence that is produced based on this election process that the protocol is utilizing. So, let's see how uh, a possible protocol execution can go. What happens is that little graphs like the one that I'm presenting here, and we call them forks, naturally emerge from such characteristic strings. So, let's examine how this comes to be. So, here on the left we have the genesis block. And that's, in a sense, the root of this, uh, this tree-like graph. What happened at time one? There was an honest party that produced block one. Now observe that the next is silent, and now, now let's examine what happens when the next honest party is activated, which is at slot number five. So the adversary served block three to that honest party, and thus, the honest party at slot 5 abandoned the block that was produced by party 1 and adopted and extended a different one. That happens because the adversary, enjoying network dominance and delivering blocks in advance, is capable of delivering its own blockchain, which extends from slot 3, the genesis block, to the party at slot 5. Let's see what happened at 7. Here is another honest party at seven that is served by the adversary block number six. That block number six extends one, and thus the chain at extended by party five is abandoned. Party eight. Observe here what, what happens. Here is a situation where you have honest parties at five and seven, but party eight chooses to extend the block 1. What happened here is that the adversary could exploit network delay and have party 8 receive the block produced by party 1 without seeing the blocks produced by parties 5 and 7. So here is a situation where network delay puts the adversary at an advantage. Finally, um, as the adversary moves on, we have an extension of the block at, from party 8 by an adversarial party at position 12. And finally, adversary serves block 12 to the honest party that extends it at slot 14. What happens now in this picture is the following. We've managed to take a protocol execution and substitute it with this tree-like graph. This tree-like graph emerges naturally from the randomized process that produces the characteristic string. The nice feature of this is that we can study now the properties of these discrete structures in order to understand the security of the protocol. How can we show eventually that the protocol converges to a single history? Because this is what is the fundamental question. So, drawing from Bitcoin analysis, uh, what happens is uh, that random walks play a fundamental role. Um, a one-dimensional random walk, actually, is, is what you can find at the core of the security analysis of Bitcoin. So, this random walk, you can think of it as follows. Imagine that there are the bad guys and the good guys. Um, Every time that the uh, bad guys uh, find a proof of work, you can imagine that there is this random walk advancing upwards. Let's say they're equal at the beginning, starting, for instance, from the genesis block, and then the 
parties that follow the adversary, the adversarial coalition, will advance this proof of work upwards with a certain probability, which is how much they can uh, find the proof of work. At the same time, the good guys will pull the random walk downwards whenever, hopefully, they, they produce a block. It turns out that this is not quite the case. What happens is that, indeed, there is a pull of this random walk downwards every time, um, almost every time, the honest parties find a proof of work. The reason that this probability is gamma and not equal to alpha, which is the probability that honest parties found the proof of work, is the fact that honest parties pay the price of being decentralized. And here, this paying the price of being decentralized, you can see by the fact that gamma is approximately alpha minus alpha square, where alpha square is the probability of two or more honest parties colliding around the same time and producing a block together. So we cannot use these uh, moments, if you want. Still, if we make the assumption, and that's the fundamental assumption that is done in uh, papers that analyze the security of Bitcoin, is that if gamma is strictly bigger than beta, this random walk is going to get a strong pull downwards and the honest parties will win. So here is an inspiration from uh, the analysis of Bitcoin. So now the question is, can we apply this logic uh, to uh, the POS setting? Unfortunately, winning a block for the honest parties does not necessarily constitute a move to the left in the random walk. And the main reason, actually, is what we cited at the beginning, costless simulation. So the adversary may reuse an opportunity to issue a block in multiple paths of the fork, exactly because this costs him nothing. So you can have bad situations like the one demonstrated uh, in this uh, graph below, and that's like a pathological execution of the protocol, where basically, see what happens, the adversary just owns three out of the total eight blocks which are shown here, and still is capable in producing a situation that completely forks the blockchain, despite the fact that he is in the minority in terms of ownership of slots. What happens is the reason of costless simulation. Slot 3 and 4 are, can be used in two separate blockchains without the adversary actually having to pay twice for that. And that's the fundamental issue of how costless simulation comes here and spoils the analysis, uh, or if you want, the proof logic uh, that was used um, in the case of Bitcoin. Nevertheless, what we've shown is that it's possible to overcome that. But we need a more complex analysis. The complex analysis that we did in the Ouroboros lines of papers uses the following features and studies these graph structures uh, that uh, represent the protocol execution. There are three important uh, quantities that are relevant when you study a protocol execution like this one. Every path that you see in the execution will have these quantities measured. The first one, we call it gap. The gap is we look at a certain path in the execution and we say how far it is from the leading one. That's the uh, gap concept. The reserve concept, on the other hand, says if we look at a certain path, how many slots are still at the full control of the adversary and the adversary might use them to advance that path forward. In that particular case, for the top path you see there, it's three slots. And finally, if you see, you subtract gap from reserve to say how, what is the reach of that specific path. So that path here has reach minus one, which represents the fact that it's a bit too short by one to win over the leading path. So if we are in such a situation and you are an honest node that follows longest chain rule, you will not be able to fool by the adversary and adopt, and adopt the top branch. You will follow, using longest chain rule, the branch that was extended by player at slot 9. A similar situation happens with the lowest branch. 
And then at the end, if we look at the whole execution, we look at two concepts. The first one, we call it reach, which is the maximum reach across all times. And the other, we call it margin, which basically says what is the second best disjoint reach. What we would like is that the margin is always below zero. That would be a setting, like in this particular one, that the adversary will not be able to fool an honest party that tries to connect in this protocol execution. And any honest party that connects in that particular execution is going to go and extend the slot that was, uh, the block that was produced by the party at slot 9. So reach and margin are the two fundamental quantities um, that are interesting when we analyze these protocol executions. And we can show that the adversary will win if and only if the margin, which is the second best disjoint uh, reach of a certain protocol execution, is at least zero. What is interesting now is that these two quantities together define a random walk which is, even though more complex than the random walk we analyzed in the case of Bitcoin, it still has some good features that we can exploit to prove security. So here's how the random walk is defined. So it's a two-dimensional random walk. And what happens is the following. Reach and margin, when the adversary wins a slot, they advance forward. So basically, both of the quantities, they go plus one. So that's like the standard one-dimensional behavior. The adversary wins a slot or wins a, a, a block, then things are towards its favor. On the other hand, when the adversary loses a slot, things are more nuanced. The one-dimensional behavior would suggest that we just go minus one. So what you see in the third branch uh, here of this equation. But that's not what happens. In fact, Reach and Martin decrement only in one of the possible cases. But what happens is that, first of all, reach will never drop below zero, and that's by definition. But what happens very interestingly from the adversarial point of view is that the adversary can prevent um, the margin from going negative by sacrificing reach. So essentially what happens is that the adversary can make margin stick to zero by using the quota, if you want, that he has accumulated in terms of reach. This completely describes the random walk. And here is a picture of it. So what you see in this picture is how now the probabilistic process that the characteristic string suggests in the protocol uh, will um, uh, induce a random walk in this reach and margin uh, quantities. What happens is that the adversary wins when you go, uh, when he gets a slot, and now you, and when the adversary wins, you see a move of the random walk towards the upper right of this diagram. That's the beta moves that you see here. And now you see what happens with the gamma moves. The gamma moves is when basically the, uh, the honest parties win a slot. And this gamma is a similar parameter to the one we've seen in the Bitcoin analysis. Now, when you are in the upper right and you get a gamma transition, what happens is that initially you can follow the same one-dimensional behavior. So beta goes upwards to the right and gamma pulls leftmost uh, to the bottom. Nevertheless, when we have the situation that margin hits zero, it's possible for the adversary to prevent uh, the margin from going zero and as we saw in the previous slide, sacrifice reach to maintain the margin to be non-zero. So somehow the adversary has a little pull to prevent this random walk from escaping to minus infinity, as it happened before. But nevertheless, uh, what we have still been able to show is that despite the fact that this random walk is more complex than the one that happens in Bitcoin, we can still prove uh, that the, ra the random walk will escape to minus infinity in the case of margin, and that means that the longest chain rule is, is going to uh, enable the parties to converge to the same uh, protocol history. So this gives you the picture of what was happening before Ouroboros Genesis uh, uh, was, uh, was suggested.
Um, the new chain selection rule takes this idea of longest chain and deals with long-range attacks. So all the analysis which we've seen so far essentially deals with short-range concerns. And up to this uh, case, this analysis completely covers us. Nevertheless, for long-range comparisons, where chains diverge, let's say, from more than k blocks, where k is a security parameter, we have to use a different rule to select the right chain. And here is the uh, novel chain selection rule, which I will explain to you with this diagram uh, that we have uh, designed for Ouroboros Genesis. So when you have, uh, uh, going back to this bootstrapping from Genesis question, which is uh, the fundamental question that a node that joins the network would like to resolve, um, you are dealing with the choice, as you see on the right, you have two chains that you have to deal, and they are forking at a certain point. Now, if this fork is kind of recent, that's like a short-range attack if you want, or a disagreement between nodes that uh, was just uh, produced naturally because of network conditions, then the longest chain rule will apply. On the other hand, if the fork is bigger than k blocks, the following plenitude type of rule is used. We go to the moment where the chains diverge, and then shortly thereafter, we isolate a certain region of blocks, and we see in this region, which is defined in the time domain, which of the two ch chains is more dense. And that's the plenitude rule. The party is going to follow the chain that is denser in the time domain, despite the fact that that chain might have a multitude number of blocks later on. So this is how the plenitude rule works. So what is interesting about this is that this rule is still quite simple to implement. It's still a quite simple rule and enhances the longest chain rule um, in a way uh, that is still quite easy to program. So what's the intuition? The intuition and what we uh, prove in the protocol is that if the majority of parties follow the protocol, then at any sufficiently long time segment, the corresponding chain of the honest parties will, will be denser, especially after a fork. So adversarial blockchains will be shortly after the divergence point will exhibit a less dense block distribution. And we can use that rule to determine what is the right blockchain to connect to. So going back and remembering the picture I showed you before about what was happening before POW and POS, what Ouroboros Genesis does is that it changes uh, the way that a POS protocol can operate in a dynamic availability environment and does away with the requirement that you need to know a recent block in order to connect to the right history of the protocol. So here is the biggest advance that uh, the uh, Roboros Genesis protocol offers and for the first time we can say now that POS blockchains can operate in the same dynamic availability setting uh, that we know uh, the Bitcoin proof-of-work based blockchain uh, to operate. So this was uh, a very quick overview of Roboros Genesis. There is more to come uh, in uh, uh, Roboros research um, and I'll just mention very quickly some of the uh, research uh, streams that you'll be uh, hearing soon um, and follow up, following up on the work that we're doing now. Importantly, the incentive structure and delegation and stake pools of the protocol um, is uh, uh, a work that we'll be releasing soon. Sidechain software updates and ecosystem sustainability is another uh, important research direction that is um, also coming up. Smart contracts and domain-specific languages for these POS blockchains a permission version of the Ouroboros blockchain is, um, is also underway. Uh, and finally, looking at how POS blockchains shard and are, can be scalable uh, in the most general uh, um, term of uh, in the more general term of the uh, of scalable sense uh, is uh, uh, something that uh, is also on our plate. So with this, thank you for uh, your attention and uh,
Um, I look forward to uh, telling you more about our research in a coming video.